Hello, and welcome to the Alex webinar, eBooks via the Cataloging and Publication Program, Metadata and Ingestion Workflows at the Library of Congress. I'm Mary Reeder, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Caroline Sacucci and Camilla Williams. Caroline is the Acting Program Manager for the Cataloging and Publication, or CIP, program, and was formerly a CIP program specialist. She is also the Dewey Program Manager in the U.S. Programs, Law, and Literature Division of the Library of Congress. She is an active member of the American Library Association and serves as chair of the Alex Public Library's Technical Services Interest Group and Dewey Section Liaison to the Alex Cataloging and Metadata Management Section Subject Analysis Committee. She is also a member of the Cataloging of Children's Materials Committee and serves as the LC Liaison to the Dewey Decimal Classification Editorial Policy Committee. Prior to working with the Dewey and CIP programs, she was a Senior Cataloging Specialist in the Geography, Political Science, and Education section of the U.S. General Division. Ms. Sakuchi has a Bachelor of Arts in History from Longwood University and a Master's in Library Science from Simmons College. Camilla Williams is a Program Specialist in the CIP program. Her responsibilities include recruiting and training new libraries and institutions to the eCIP Cataloging Partnership Program and participating in new automated and metadata initiatives. She is the primary contact for the CIP eBooks program. Before joining the CIP program, Camilla was a senior cataloging specialist in the Social Science section of the U.S. Publisher and Liaison Division. She is a member of the District of Columbia Library Association and regularly gives presentations at ALA, at CIP advisory group meetings, and at the Library of Congress exhibit booth. Camilla is also a member of the District of Columbia Veterans of Foreign Wars Ladies Auxiliary and serves as its technical advisor. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. This webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen, hashtag AlexCE. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed, however. If you have questions for Caroline and Camilla, please type them into the question box on your screen and they will answer them at the end of their presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we're on the air will be answered offline and the answers sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and evaluation within two days. Please do take the time to fill out the evaluation form since it will be used by the Continuing Education Committee to plan future events. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Caroline. Good afternoon. This is Caroline speaking and Camilla and I also want to welcome you to the webinar. This is who we are so you can see who's speaking today. We have included our email addresses in case you wish to contact us after the presentation. If you attended last week's webinar, the new SIP data block, how to use it for cataloging, yes, I'm the same person, and I hope many of you did because one of the reasons for that new SIP data block is the SIP eBooks program, which is what we're going to talk about today. This is our agenda for today's webinar. I'll give you some background to the SIP program, talk about SIP eBooks metadata pilot, introduce the new SIP eBooks application, and discuss the eBooks metadata process. Then I'll turn it over to Camilla to talk about the eBook ingestion workflow, metadata maintenance, and what's ahead for the SIP eBooks program. At the end, we hope to have time for questions. So first, let's talk about the SIP program generally. The SIP program has continued to maintain its purpose since its inception in 1971. And that purpose is to serve the nation's libraries by cataloging books in advance of publication. Publishers used to apply and print on paper applications, but since 2003, they have been submitting their applications via a web form. LC creates the bib record and sends that data in the form of a SIP data block to the publisher, who then prints it on the copyright page. LC distributes SIP records via the MARC record distribution services. These SIP records get redistributed in products and services designed to alert the library community about forthcoming publications 
and can, facil and can facilitate acquisition of new titles. For those of you in attending this webinar who really never thought about the SIP process, here is a summary. The publisher, assuming it already has been approved to apply for SIP, which, it's, which is its own process, applies for SIP data for an individual title. The application lands in the inbox of a SIP publisher liaison who reviews the application, makes sure everything is in order, and that the attached galley is the right one. Once the liaison accepts the application, that application is assigned a Library of Congress control number, or LCCN, and then is sent to the default cataloging section. The default cataloging section is governed by the BISAC heading, which the publisher selected in the application for SIP data. For instance, Christian fiction defaults to the literature section. Then the section either catalogs the resource or refers it to another section for cataloging if it's out of scope. The application is then forwarded to the Dewey section to assign the Dewey number. The Dewey section returns the completed SIP to the publisher liaison. The publisher liaison then sends a formatted email with the SIP data block to the publisher, who then is supposed to print the SIP data block in the book and send us a copy. A member of the SIP technical team checks in the incoming SIP book and creates the holdings and items records before sending it to the cataloging section for SIP verification, which is the process of making sure the bibliographic record accurately reflects the published book, adding pagination, etc. Once the book has undergone SIP verification, it can go to the stacks for use by our readers. There can be variations to this workflow, but that is the basic process still remains the process for all applications for print titles. This is the publisher's dashboard in the SIP Traffic Manager, which is a web-based program designed in 2003 to process applications for SIP data. To apply for SIP data, the publisher selects SIP data application. This is the beginning of the SIP data application. The publisher fills in the ISBNs and selects a subject. The application goes on to ask specific questions such as whether the title is a graphic novel, a multi-part, intended for a juvenile audience, is in a series, etc. Before the publisher can submit the application, it needs to attach the galley in ASCII format. Most print SIP titles are cataloged within our traffic manager with a mark editing software called On the Mark. This software takes the galley of the publication and creates a cataloger work screen. The galley information is at the top. Catalogers highlight text and select the field from the buttons on the left. Once the basic descriptive cataloging is complete, the cataloger clicks the send button at the bottom left to create a record in our cataloging database. Once the cataloging is complete, the publisher liaison sends the SIP data to the publisher. If the publisher needs to make a change to any piece of the bibliographic data, has canceled the publication, or has changed the projected publication date, they can submit a change request. If the publication is canceled, we will delete the bibliographic record from our database. This causes a delete workflow so that the record in OCLC can be marked for deletion, although we do not control the OCLC process. So now let's look at how we started creating metadata for eBooks via the SIP program. The development of an initiative to create eSIP records for eBooks based on original SIP records for print books began in 2011 and has been a very exciting development. The SIP program decided to commit its resources to eBooks for several reasons. An obvious primary reason was expansion of its service to the nation's libraries. The need for accurate metadata for eBooks has been expressed by many libraries. Another important reason was to provide service to publishers. A number of publishers have expressed interest in receiving SIP data for eBooks. We can see that a current publishing pattern is simultaneous publication of eBooks along with print versions of the same title. Publishers are able to use the same files that create the printed book to create the eBook format. This makes sense because it allows publishers to reach markets that still want print while at the same time expanding sales to the electronic market for the same titles. 
Many publishers are also offering a package of print plus ebook. SIP data in the ebook and in distribution to libraries via OCLC and vendors will assist publishers in reaching those markets. Our process for creating the SIP data developed by cataloging automation specialist David Williamson in concert with other LC programmers takes the original SIP record for the print version of the book and converts it to a record for the e-version, adding the appropriate data elements that identify it as an e-book record. Our potential participants were contacted first by phone to provide them with a description of the pilot. After they expressed interest, they were sent a letter which detailed the requirements I described. Once they agreed to the requirements, they were given access to the eBooks application and change request forms in the traffic manager beginning on October 11, 2011. Only our three participating publishers had access to these forms. The University Press of Mississippi, which is a consortium of the state's university presses, Wiley Blackwell, including the imprint Jossie Bass, and the World Bank. As part of the pilot, we developed an application to participate in order for the pilot publishers to confirm that their understanding of the requirements of the eBooks program. Participating publishers must publish simultaneous print books and eBooks in order to participate, since the eBook record creation is based on the existing record for print. They have to apply for the SIP data for the print book first through our regular application process, which required attachment of an electronic galley in ASCII format, as I described before, and which allows it to be accessed in the traffic manager for cataloging purposes. They must apply for the ebook SIP data within 10 business days, and the unaltered SIP data would be printed on each version's copyright page. Publishers would confirm that they market their ebooks to libraries. Publishers who participated were required to provide a complimentary copy of the ebook to the library when it was published, just as for print books. The SIP program requires a best edition for ebooks, just as it does for print books. This would be the EPUB or PDF version created by the original publisher, not altered for use by a particular reader, and with no digital rights management attached. This is required by the Library of Congress so that we can provide the same access to ebooks that we provide to print books that are received via the SIP program in that there will be no limit on the number of items the book may be read. The SIP program, working with IT staff first, had to create an application for ebooks based on the print edition application. The publisher first had to apply for data for the print book. This is the same form I showed you at the beginning of the webinar. Only now the title and subtitle and publisher, author is already uh, in, the, in the application. I'm sorry, this is for the print, same thing. Then they had participating publishers successfully submitted an application for the print version. They needed to return to the main menu and click on a link that said, SIP data application for ebooks. When they, checked, when they clicked on that link, they retrieved a list of the print titles for which they had applied. They selected a title for which they also wanted to apply for an ebook. They had 10 business days to complete this process or the list would disappear. They retrieved a simplified SIP data application which had been pre-populated with the title and the ISBNs from the print book applications. The only data elements that could be entered were the ISBNs for the ebook, qualified by formats such as EPUB or PDF, and a series statement if there was a series that applied only to the ebook. If the publisher had changes that were specific to the ebook, such as different ISBNs or series information, they could submit an application for ebooks. Typically, the cataloging team that catalogued the print title is given the print change request to make the changes. However, if there is an ebook associated with the title, change requests for both print and ebook versions are handled by SIP program specialists. Ever since the metadata piece of the SIP ebooks pilot went into production in August 2012, we have been looking for a way to simplify the application process to attract more publishers. On October 1st, 2015, so just a few weeks ago, the SIP program implemented a new application process for publishers. So now let's look at how the SIP program handles the ebook application today. 
To begin with, publishers no longer needed to ask to participate. They simply could apply for SIP data. The SIP program, working with IT staff, developed a new SIP data application that allows the publisher to apply for print plus the ebook on a single application. They no longer need to submit an application for the print and then submit another for the ebook. We're very excited about the implementation of the new single print plus ebook application and hope that it encourages more publishers to apply for ebook metadata. The application is very similar to the original print only application. You can see fields for title, subtitle, edition, publishers, U.S. city, and up to three authors. Then the publisher can identify whether the title is in large print format, a graphic novel, in multiple volumes, and whether it includes biographical, bibliographical information and or indexes. The publisher then inputs as many ISBNs as are relevant to the work. The new piece of this application is the ebook information. Publishers are requested to check the box to receive a single SIP data block that includes print and ebook information for that title. And by checking this box, they are agreeing to the terms and conditions, which I will discuss on the next slide. Then they can fill in all the ebook ISBNs such as EPUB, PDF, Nook, Kindle, etc. They are not required to check the box. Even if they do not check the box, we still ask them for the ebook ISBNs. If they had clicked on the blue terms and conditions link, they would see this text. They are agreeing to do the following. Number one, publish simultaneous print, print books and ebooks. Number two, include the composite SIP data on the copyright page of the print and ebook versions. And number three, provide a complimentary copy of the ebook to the library when it is published, just as they do for print books. The SIP program requires a best edition for ebooks, which is the EPUB or PDF version, created by, an original, by the original publisher, not altered for use by a particular reader, and with no digital rights management attached. Publishers should still submit change applications for the print and for the ebook if there are specific ebook changes such as ISBN. And as I mentioned earlier, if a print record has an associated ebook, our traffic manager will indicate that and a SIP program specialist will make the changes to both records. Even though we had developed a new process for the SIP application for publishers, the metadata workflow has remained the same since the beginning of the initiative. So let's now take a look at that. Processing of the application begins with the assignment of a unique LCCN from an annual supply that is stored within the traffic manager. New programming retrieves the LCCN and ebook data elements supplied by the publisher, such as the ISBNs and series information if, if applicable. This data is then transferred to the application that creates the ebook record. The program retrieves the original record for the print book from the library's Voyager database, adds the supplied ebook data elements, including the new LCCN, and also adds standard data elements for ebooks, such as one online resource in the physical description field and a 776 field, which serves the purpose of linking the ebook record to the print record through the print LCCN and ISBN. The Provider Neutral eMonograph Record Guide, which was developed by the program, the, developed by the program for Cooperative Cataloging, or PCC, was the source of information for how ebooks should be structured. So let's take a look at the bibliographic record for the print, which is created by a cataloger. Please note the ISBNs for both the print and ebook versions. Well, in this case, there's only one for the, uh, the print. The LC classification in the 050 field and the Dewey Decimal classification number in the 082 field, the author, title, publication and series information, as well as all Library of Congress subject headings. The record creation program accesses the catalog record for the print version of the title to create the ebook record. Here is the ebook record based on the print record we just saw on the previous slide. The record creation program added the assigned LCCN 
as well as data elements such as ISBNs for the ebook and inserted one online resource in the 300 physical description field. The LC classification stem and Dewey decimal numbers are copied over as well as the LC subject headings, which we will see on the next screen. Please note that the record is suppressed as indicated in the checkbox near the top, suppressed from OPAC. All ebook records are automatically suppressed until we develop a way for readers to access the content. Here is the rest of the ebook record. Note that the 337 field indicates that this is a computer media type, and 338 field indicates that the carrier type is online resource. Note that the 588 field, which contains the text, description based on print version record and SIP data provided by publisher, resource not viewed. All of the ebook records created in this process have this standard note in them. Now you can see the various 6XX subject heading fields, which were copied over from the print record. The other notable field is the 776 field, which serves the purpose of linking the ebook record to the print record through the print LCCN and ISBN. After the ebook record is created, a reciprocating 776 field is automatically added to the bibliographic record for the print version. As I said, the publisher liaison sends the SIP data to the publisher once the application is complete. The new composite print plus ebook SIP data block was also just implemented on October 1, 2015. If any of you saw last week's webinar on the new SIP data block, you will be familiar with the layout. It includes the LCCNs and ISBNs for the print and the ebook, but does not include any e-specific notes, such as one online resource or the description based on print version record note. Also, no linking notes appear in the SIP data block. Because this data block is suitable for both versions, it can and should be printed on the copyright page of the print and ebook versions. This alleviates the problem of publishers using the print or ebook specific data block in the wrong format. For example, printing the print version data block in the ebook, a common problem since publishers tend to use the same file to produce both versions. Library of Congress Management decided to move the pilot into production effective August 22, 2012. We put out a call for more publishers to participate. We continue to work both internally at LC and with, actual, and with publishers to develop means for ingesting, storing, and making the actual ebook available to internal users at the Library of Congress. As of September 30, 2015, the SIP eBooks program has 198 participating publishers and had created metadata for 7,948 eBook titles. The Library of Congress has not developed the means to access the eBooks, so the corresponding bibliographic records are suppressed from the OPAC. They are, however, viewable and usable in OCLC WorldCat because our eBook records are distributed to OCLC and other MARC customers. In fact, this is one of the most important outcomes of the SIP eBooks program. At an OCLC member forum last year, Cynthia Whitaker, OCLC Department Manager, World Cat Quality, and OCLC representative to the SIP Advisory Group, talked about how she manages the contract cataloging staff who update and enrich ebook records from vendors such as OverDrive and OCLC, and how OCLC uses ebook records for this work. She said that LC created SIP ebook records are the most complete and accurate records, and she mentioned that vendors such as Yankee Book Peddler are also using our records in their ebook packages for libraries. The one thing that OCLC will do is add an 856 field with the publisher's website to the bibliographic record, and which allows the bibliographic record to display as an e-resource on WorldCat. So now we have a question for you. I see that all of you have already answered all the questions, or almost all of you have answered the questions. Um, 
most of you are saying yes that you were aware that um, our records were available. <laughs> so that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so let's continue on with the program. And I will pass the webinar to com oh, there we go. <laughs> and I will pass the webinar on to Camilla to discuss how we process the ebooks themselves. And there will be a short delay as we transfer the webinar screen to Camilla. Oops. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you again for joining us. I'm Camilla Williams. So once we had the metadata portion in place, it was then time to move into receiving the ebooks for which the library had provided the SIP data. Representatives from the SIP program, including Caroline and myself, began meeting with staff at LC's ITS or Information Technology Services now part of the Office of the Chief Information Officer. ITS would be setting up and providing the secure server space inside LC's firewall where ebooks will remain until LC staff processed them and they were moved to long-term storage. Staff from RDC or the Repository Development Center would develop the software that LC staff would use to view and process the ebook. The group decided to use the same publishers University Press of Mississippi, World Bank, and Wiley that were part of the metadata pilot of the eBooks program. We began the eBooks ingestion pilot in 2012. In consultation with ITS, the eBooks group decided that publishers would push their eBook files to the Library of Congress using Secure File Transfer Protocol, or SFTP. The group also developed a publisher account form where we were asked for the name and contact information for the person primarily responsible for sending the ebooks as well as the company's IP address. ITS would use the IP address of the company to ensure that the ebook files were sent from the correct firm. Realizing that publishers could use aggregators to send their ebooks to the library, the group decided that ITS staff would need to distinguish between who was sending the content or the content sender and who was providing the content or the also uh, content provider. Content provider would be the publisher. Content center, sender is the aggregator who is sending content on behalf of their client. Or the content sender could also be a publisher that is sending content on behalf of their smaller imprints. ITS would use this information to establish the publisher and aggregator accounts and directories on the Library of Congress Secure Server. After many discussions and iterations, ITS determined that they would create a SIP eBooks directory. Any publisher or content provider that sent their own eBook files would have their own directory. Then any aggregator would have their own directory and their clients will have a directory in the aggregator's directory. The aggregator would be responsible for ensuring that the ebook files will be pushed to the correct directory. This process can be lengthy because of ITS protocols that must be adhered to for security reasons and is best suited for the larger publishing companies that have specialized departments that handles their ebook distributions. To assist the smaller publishing companies to submit their ebooks to the library, the SIP program is investigating a means where the publisher will be able to use a web interface similar to a Dropbox to submit their ebooks individually. We hope that this process will be easier to use and allow less technically savvy publishing companies to join the SIP ebooks program. The SIP ebooks group discussed and came up with a few best practices for publishers to send their ebook files. We decided to have the publishers upload their books in EPUB or PDF format, with EPUB, EPUB being the SIP program's preferred format. We wanted one, book per one ebook per delivery or one zip file. 
Each file will contain the EPUB or PDF file and will also include any separate cover image. And each file should be named with the ISBN. After the publishers upload their ebooks to LC, the ebooks go through malware scanning and any ITS automated process. The SIP program staff access and process the ebooks through our content transfer services, a web based software that is used for many digital projects at LC. This in house developed software tracks the new ebook files from the time they arrive on the server until they are moved into long-term storage. Now that we had a way for publishers to submit their ebook files and for LC to manage those files, SIP program management came up with a workflow that assigned ebooks to staff for processing, which includes viewing the ebook, updating the ebook record, and moving the ebook file into long-term storage. Now I'm going to show a portion of the content transfer services application. This is the view of the check-in manager. A SIP ebook check-in manager sees the list of unassigned ebooks and distributes them among staff members for processing. The check-in page also gives brief instructions to staff on how to view and process the ebook. Staff need to view the ebook and this software provides an embedded viewer. Staff navigate through the ebook using the drop down list based on the book's table of contents. One of the items that SIP program staff looks for is the SIP data block. The one pictured here is for the print version of the book. As we mentioned before, because many publishers use the same file for the electronic and print versions of the book, this is a common occurrence and one of the primary reasons why we went to a composite data block. Continuing with the SIP check-in process, this system is able to pull information from the library's integrated library system. The Library of Congress control number and title are provided. The handle suffix is the end portion of a URL that will provide access to the ebook to an authorized user. If everything checks out with the ebook, we will accept the ebook. Just as with print books, the correct SIP data should be printed in the ebook. Once we accept the ebook, it is then moved to long term storage. At this time, the SIP program is only accepting ebooks for which we provide a SIP data. If the ebook file is corrupted in any way, no cover or incorrect table of contents, for example, we will reject the ebook. The SIP program will notify the publisher of the reason for the rejection and ask for a new or updated version of the ebook. As part of the ingestion process, staff also update the metadata, and I'll show you that process now. Just with the print, the staff member must also verify that the metadata in the ebook bibliographic record matches the ebook. During the check-in process that I just showed you, the staff member will make any changes to the bib record. Common changes include title or subtitle, and often the bub publication date has changed. The handler from the content transfer service application is also inserted into the holdings record. As Caroline mentioned, we are unable to provide access for our ebooks, so the bibliographic and holdings records are suppressed from the OPAC. Here's an example of the completed ebook record. Although the, re the record is suppressed from the OPAC, the checkbox near the top of the screen, the record is redistributed to bibliographic utilities. The URL in the A56 will access the ebook in the library's collection, not the vendor or aggregator's website. This record is also suppressed until we are able to provide access, <coughs> excuse me, to the ebooks. Once we began processing and accepting ebooks, 
we noticed that a publisher had begun sending duplicate copies of their eBooks. And we were wondering why CTS, the content transfer services software, had not flagged the eBook delivery as a duplicate. In CTS, duplicates are detected by checking the upload manifest, or checksum, as well as the byte size. If everything matches, CTS should detect it and flag it as a duplicate. And the SIP program specialist verifies that the ebook delivery is indeed a duplicate. However, upon further investigation, the publisher notified us that it was sending us corrected or updated copies of their ebooks. The corrected versions included typo and other small changes that the publishers had determined does not constitute a new publication. The file size is usually different from the previous delivery, and the upload manifest would be different. The staff member who's assigned this ebook will need to search for the bibliographic record to determine if this is a new uh, delivery. And a separate workflow process is being formulated to update this process. After months of development, quality control, and user testing, the ingest portion of the SIP eBooks program moved into production effective July 2014. Uh, as we mentioned before, we accept eBooks in PDF and EPUB formats. And as of September 30th, 2015, we have received 4,505 eBooks and added 4,270 of those eBooks to the digital collections. I always like to mention that the first ebook processed and accepted into long term storage was The Ugly Caterpillar, Caterpillar by Carl Summers. And now we have another question for you. Does your institution collect or provide access to your ebooks through your own collection or through a vendor? Well, it looks like most of you have answered, and the majority of you uh, look like you provide access to your ebooks through a vendor. I believe here at the library we're in a special uh, circumstance since the publisher is required to send us a copy of their ebooks. Okay, so moving on to oops. so continuing on with our program, we're going to discuss what's ahead. Okay, there we go. Okay, we have come a long way since SIP eBooks program started in 2011, but we still have a ways to go. At every step, we consult with internal LC policy groups to ensure that we are following the overall mission and strategy of the Library of Congress. Obviously, we want to include more publishers and get more e-content for the library's digital, digital collections, and we hope that the single print plus e-book application will encourage more publishers. 
As I mentioned also, we are working on a web-based application for publishers to upload their ebooks as a web interface instead of pushing their files to a server. And we hope that this will encourage smaller publishers to submit their ebooks. For our, our target for the 2016 fiscal year is to ingest 7,500 ebooks with increases in future years. Right now, we are solely focused on simultaneously published print plus electronic. The next development would be to continue creating metadata for digital born ebook titles and to ingest them. And finally, a major initiative is to provide access to these ebooks. We know that we can successfully create the metadata, ingest the ebooks, and put them in the long term storage, but we want the the Congress, as well as our other readers and patrons, to have access to this content as well. We look forward to the development of the eBooks program at the Library of Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline and Camillo. That was very interesting. So right now you're only accepting EPUB and PDF. So there's no. Are there any plans to accept anything else eventually? Um, I think eventually that we will be able to. But I think at this point, since the majority of the eBooks seem to be either in EPUB or PDF, we're sticking with that at that time. And I think we're also accepting EPUB three, although that just started. Um, being widely used by publishers. Okay. And I was curious, on the MARC records for the print, does the 776 field display in your OPAC or not? Is that suppressed? So others know that the ebook is um, out there somewhere? You know, I'm not sure. I, <laughs> I never bothered to look. Um, <laughs> um, the point of it, obviously, is to be able to pull up both. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were doing a, a search either on title or ISBN or LCCN, um, the, both records would come up in your search as a hit. But, you know, I never thought to look to see. It's not something, I mean, if you were interested to see, Camilla has the, um, the show. She could uh, look it up in our OPAC to see, but um, I don't know if you want to see that. Sure, um, wouldn't hurt. Camilla, do you want to do that? Uh, or you can give, give me the, the floor and I will do it. <laughs> yeah, I say, let's turn it back over to if you have one available because I'd have to start everything. Um, well, I would just pull up the web, the web OPAC, um, because you're, look, you're interested to see if it displays it to the public, right, Mary? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you gave me um, presenter stuff, uh, I can pull up um, search. Actually, I can search the one that's actually in the example. Uh, one second. And to the audience, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the questions box. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Okay. So let me pull up the OPAC. Ah, this is our traffic manager homepage <laughs> for those of you who. Uh, wonder what it looks like for us. This is what it looks like. It's a lovely gray screen, <laughs> but it was 2003, and actually we're working with a contract to um, get an updated version of the traffic manager. And One of the things I'm looking forward to is having a more modern looking traffic manager. <laughs> <laughs> Catalog.loc.com. Oh, right. It's not only text-based. It could be worse. It could be much worse. That's right. Um, I think there's some publishers that are um, in the audience, and one of the things that we're hoping to do with the new contract is get away from ASCII. <laughs> and I know that the publishers are like, yay, we don't want to deal with ASCII anymore. Um, but it's been working for us, so for all these years, since 2003. Okay, so um, what is that? 2015, 290, Um, Did I not type it in correctly? 215, 290, 29, oh, this is so teeny tiny, 29, <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. Let me type it up by title. Maybe that would be easier. Uh, French Historical Revolution. Historical Revolution. Title. Search. Two 
2015. Uh, it's probably the second. Oh, no. uh, well, basically, we're interested to see whether or not it shows. Yeah, is it displaying that, that link? A display. Uh, mark tag. I mean, if we we're interested in the mark format, let's see, does it display in the mark? It does not display in the mark. Okay. Interesting. All right. So people don't know the E is even out there yet. Um, how far along well, that's, are you in your... Oh, well, it's suppressed, so yeah. they wouldn't yeah. see it in our database. Yeah. Um, yeah. How far along do you think you guys are towards actually being able to dis dis display your e-books? Do you think that'll be in the next year or two? Um, that is hard to say because um, we're lucky enough right now to be in a situation where we've got finally an office, what is it, the chief information officer position has been recently filled and we're hoping that once that person, you know, sort of gets into the role that we'll be able to get some direction. Um, there are a lot of moving parts related to this, um, yes. questions like, are we going to be able to provide access only on site? Are we going to be able to provide access to anyone who's an authorized user, no matter where in the world they are? Um, are we, and how do we define authorized user? And um, will there be multiple people, users allowed to use a particular e-resource at a time, or only one? Or so there are all kinds of issues um, related to sort of policy, and then there, of course there's the technical piece of um, how, how can we make that possible? So we have aspirations yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to do this. <laughs> you see how the publishers react to that since they make us all do all kinds of licensing. Is it a single user? Is it a multiple user? And right. how they'll deal with you guys in this. Right. Well, That's we're fortunate in the sense that um, publishers have been trusting us with their books for years. And we're hoping that as a secure lockdown network that that's also going to be the case that they will trust us with their their data. Right now things are in a dark archive. Um, the process that Camilla showed, um, the stuff is in long-term storage with no way to access it right now. So it's very secure. <laughs> no one can do anything with it. Once we, once, once the SIP process, the, the SIP check-in process for those ebooks is completed, they are in a dark storage somewhere. And until we can unsuppress those records and display them, um, the only way that we'll be able to access them is through that holdings record with the um, the, uh, the the handle in the 856 field, and, the, and that's what's going to pull it up. Okay. So yeah. Interesting. Okay. Hopefully in the next year or two, but it's hard to know. That would be good. That would be good. It'll it'll be a shame if you can't find some way to display them outside of the library because, you know, obviously with your books you could interlibrary loan them if you if people requested them, but the E will be a little trickier that way. Well, we have, you know, we have the Congress, which is yeah. not yeah. us, per se. I mean, they are and that they're on the same, like, block. In the same city. <laughs> but, you know, they are our primary customers. Um, we have overseas offices, so there might be st staff who work in foreign countries um, who are part of our staff. Um, and we have places in other parts of the country that are related to the Library of Congress. So for instance, in Culpeper, Virginia, we have the National um, Audiovisual Conservation Center. And um, all of our digital, all of our, sorry, audio and, and video files, so moving images and, and sound recordings and all of that uh, is stored there. They aren't actually here on campus at the Library of Congress on Capitol Hill, but wouldn't they be considered a user? So, yeah. Um, yeah. That, you know, it's, so it's more than just the local network, it also would be the wider area network. Um, but then as anyone who's um, logged in to the Library of Congress via their reader registration, are they considered a, past, uh, a patron who could have access from home? Yes. You know, these are all the questions that they're still working out. Right. So. And how many ebook vendors did you say are participating again now? Um, we have a hundred, well, by vendor, do you mean that are submitting applications for metadata or yes. who are, okay, 198 are submitting applications for metadata. But um, it's a slower process to get, and a much more um, complicated process right now to get the ebooks ingested. Um, I mean, once, once the process is set up, as Camilla would tell you, the process for them to send it is very simple. But um, it can be a little bit 
some hand holding involved and Camilla is very She's very friendly with publishers. She's, she doesn't bite. So any publishers in the audience, you know, Camilla will be happy to talk to you about um, how to set up an FTP, SFTP account um, to have books submitted. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience. So if you guys have them, you know, now's your chance to ask. I guess we explained everything so well that yes. they don't have any extra questions. <laughs> <laughs> we have come a long way um, uh, since 2000. Gosh, Camilla, when did you all start this process of even thinking about ebooks? It was before I became acting program manager, so, and it was yeah. before the pilot, so. Yeah, I think that actually started close to late 2010, maybe 2000. early, yeah, or early yeah. 2011. I mean, I kind of remember sitting in sort of the, the SIP group meetings, listening to the discussion about it, but the actually getting it sort of implemented was such a huge um, process and, and was such a major um, event. And then even better, getting those fir that <laughs> getting that first ebook ingested, I know that was like a really big deal. Yeah, Which is why was. Camilla's so happy about um, <laughs> Ugly Caterpillar, she just, because it was such a huge, <laughs> huge event for us to, not be because we do have we have packages with vendors for access to e-content. E um, that's not something that the Library of Congress has to do. In fact, I know for um, the Congress, we even have um, Kindles that they can borrow that have access to material. But that's through a vendor. This is a different program. This is sort of like building our digital collection for the posterity of the Library of Congress for the people of the United States, um, and it's being preserved and being maintained and being checked on and being. Um, um, and, and being archived because, you know, as we know, digital content is, could be ephemeral in a way. We just don't yeah. know. Um, and who knows, at some point we may be only ever getting ebook content as opposed to print only. We've noticed yeah. that there's been no slowdown in print. Um, we are definitely um, overwhelmed with print material coming to the Library of Congress through various sources, either acquired through purchase or through exchange or through the SIP program, through the copyright deposit program. Um, so print is not going away, but it could be in the future, who knows, that the e-book the e would be the primary way that we would build collections, so who knows. Okay. Uh, and this is just one avenue of doing it. But in terms of providing access to e-material, we've been doing that for, for e-books, we've been doing that for a number of years now, but this is really a way to, the, the copyright program has an e-serials deposit program where um, publishers can be depositing e-serials, e but not really, um, they're not as well set up yet for the, um, the, the processing of the e-book, and the SIP program has been sort of um, leading the way for the, for the, for the e-book um, monograph. Um, so we're working with the Copyright Office to sort of, you know, work together to um, come up with workflows. Um, and then, you know, it's always sort of an IT infrastructure. How do we sort of ramp that up? And so yeah, I guess that was another question I had, and maybe you guys wouldn't know the answer, but there is a like an archiving plan in in place to refresh these files so that you know, they don't fall prey to bit rot. <laughs> and keep them all backed up so that they don't suddenly disappear if one server goes down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Camilla, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, well, right now the the uh, archiving project, they're all saved to tape. Oh, okay. Um, which is a little yeah. bit more expensive, but I think yeah. it's more uh, stable, more sturdy kind of uh, archiving. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's interesting. Yeah, and right now it does take a little bit to retrieve it from tape, this depends on how many uh, processes are ahead of you. So hopefully we'll, a we'll be able to update that process. We don't need, a we don't want our patrons to have to wait, you know, hours <laughs> yeah. to be able to retrieve yeah. that e that ebook. So all the tapes are stored in a vault somewhere in DC itself then? Or are they Probably not there? DC, but I'm not really sure where. Okay. okay. All right. Going once, going twice on questions from the audience. <laughs> Otherwise, I have asked everything that I have, so I think we're going to switch back to me.
All right. Well, thank you, ladies. That was very interesting, and I appreciated it. And thank you to all of our attendees. We hope you found today's session useful. Soon you'll be receiving a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable, and they do help us plan upcoming events. Information about all ELEX continuing education opportunities can be found on the ELEX homepage at the URL on your screen. Upcoming webinars include the three-part series, Challenges of Managing Streaming Media and Other Digital Content, which includes sessions on licensing and pricing of streaming media, as well as video game collections. On December 2nd will be Tactics for Time Management and Organizational Skills, which I'm particularly looking forward to, followed by an RDA Serials Cataloging Update on December 8th. Suggestions for webinars and other continuing education opportunities are always welcome at any time. Please submit your proposal using the Suggest a Webinar Topic link on the upcoming ELEX events page. I would like to thank Iping Chen Gaffey for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support she and her colleagues on the Technical Support Subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll participate in other ELEX continuing education offerings again in the future. Have a great day!